Aloha and welcome to The Creative Life, a collaborative production between ThinkTech Hawaii and the American Creativity Association. Dr. Brian, Dr. Brian Barnes joins us today from Louisville, Kentucky, where Dr. Barnes is a professor of philosophy at the University of Louisville. He is also a renowned scholar at the Foundation for Critical Thinking. Today, we shall focus on Dr. Barnes' role at the Foundation, especially as we explore some of the major structures in our thinking as they relate to criticality and creativity. Very simply, our overarching question for the framework of our discussion is, can one think critically without thinking creatively, or can one think creatively without thinking critically? So Dr. Barnes, just to get us started, how might you and your colleagues at the Foundation for Critical Thinking define critical thinking? Hey, Darlene, thanks so much for having me and for uh, allowing me to represent the Foundation on today's show. I'm really happy to be here. We're happy to have you with us. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, in terms of critical thinking, there's so many ways to define critical thinking. I like this one thinking about your thinking while you're thinking in order to improve your thinking. So we're trying to develop skills for our thinking such that we can bring them in real time to the problems of living and be able to come up with our best thinking when we really need it instead of, you know, on the drive home or later on in the shower thinking, ah, I should have thought about it this way. Thinking Wonder about our thinking in real time. I wonder how many of us do that. Uh, clearly, we do we do think in real time, obviously, but I wonder how many of us, to the portion you're mentioning, think about how we're doing that. How about uh, giving this a try, too, before we get started? Since being a philosopher, you know we must clarify the concept, right? Sure. So how would you define creativity? When I think of creativity, I think about someone or even perhaps something. You know, we have... Uh, a lot of creativity perhaps with artificial intelligence these days and maybe even in the animal world. I think about the ability to um, imaginatively bring something new into existence, whether that's a, a process or a product or maybe just an idea. So creativity for me involves some kind of a process of bringing a new thing into being. I think, um, and, and let me know what you think about this. I mean, often when, when we mention the word new with creativity, mm -hmm. sometimes folks will start to think, well, it has to be something revolutionary, new, oh. completely new. But uh, might you be thinking, as, I, as sometimes I do, that you could be looking at something that already exists in a different way, maybe perhaps breaking it down into its parts and then reconceptualizing it into a new thing. What do you think? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, when we talk about any idea or any object, uh, nothing exists in a vacuum. We can't even understand what something is unless related to other things, right? I mean, um, everything, every idea exists in its relationship to other ideas. And every product or service that we have, every object in our environment, is something that we relate to in terms of concepts and, um, and those mental features. So yeah, I mean, I think derivative knowledge can still be new. I can, be, I can come up with a new way to think about my coffee grounds if I'm at a coffee shop, right? Like, what do you do? You throw them away. We don't need those things anymore. Well, you can think about what might we do with them, like maybe turn them back into soil so we can grow food or something like that. That would be maybe a new concept for me, but definitely one that's related to the trash that was already there. It's just a matter of finding the angles. How can I control my responses to the material that's already in my head such that I can cause it to maybe flower in a new direction? Hmm. Makes a lot of sense to me. And I think it probably does to our viewers too. It's, it's quite a, a nice start. Um, since we're here to talk about, you're on the creative life, and if time permits, we have to talk about how creatively you live in your life. Uh, but what parts of the whole schemata of thinking critically or, or critical thinking, how do you think that relates to creativity or how much is usable, interchangeable? Well, it's all valuable in there. I mean, 
For us, there are a number of important structures, and we might really look at five pieces of the critical thinking process, which is too much for people to just grab really quickly. But, but, but if I may, um, one of the things that we can do is we can break our thinking into pieces. And for our critical thinking system, um, deriving from the work mainly of Dr. Richard Paul and Dr. Linda Elder, um, a few other important folks in there like Gerald Nozich at the Foundation for Critical Thinking, uh, we think that there are probably eight basic structures that are involved in thinking and that I can drill down into those structures anytime I want to in order to find out, in case I don't know, what the big questions are on this topic what my purpose is with this topic, what my assumptions are about the topic, what the implications are if I succeed or fail with this endeavor. So the analysis part can really help me with creativity because maybe what I want to do is change my purpose toward one that will get a very different outcome. Maybe I want to take the same old set of ideas and I want to run them through a whole different theoretical point of view such that maybe I would organize them differently to potentially achieve different outcomes. A lot of times we do this with analogy. We think, oh, this process is maybe like one that I'm not doing right now, but I read about it in the Harvard Business Review or whatever. So maybe we give it a try for our industry or for our business activity or for our creative outlet and see how that goes. So just being able to break my thinking into pieces such that I can look at each piece and determine if it's what I want or what I don't want and really help my creative process. Another thing that happens when I'm being creative is that I'm often, I, I'm, I'm in a position where I need to judge the products as I'm creating them. Do I wanna to continue to go in this direction? Is this satisfying the purpose that I have? Are the various uh, constituents of this project being represented the way that I want them to be? And that takes some method of evaluation. And so we have some intellectual standards that we think people should take a look at, creative processes of any type, whether they're what we might call critical thinking type stuff, or whether it's you know, something uh, as creatively common as someone sketching a, a cartoon on, a, on a, a paper napkin or something, we can determine whether I'm conveying the ideas I wanna convey here clearly, with precision, in a deep or a shallow way, in a logical or an illogical way, um, and a number of other standards. Um, that's, those are two of the five. We also have characteristics that people can, can use to help train themselves to have certain intellectual habits as opposed to others. We have strategies for people avoiding irrational uh, and unconscious biases in their thinking. And then the fifth part that I would point to is, a, is an overarching structural system such that if I wanted to create critical thinking mechanisms for my work that would assist me in my work, whether it's in my institution or whether it's in my own personal thinking, I could do that with this, uh, with this system of, of, of guided structured um, criticality that we have. We call it polarities. Anyway, five pieces. Five pieces, okay. So it's, it seems to me and, and to many others that uh, automatically with creativity, it, it seems to be a commendation. And we don't say, we usually say that's great, that you're so creative, or it was such a creative production. Mm -hmm. uh, very rarely do you hear, oh, he's so creative, you know, with an angry mind or, or an angry expression. Why do you think that is? I think that we often want to encourage people to be creative because we see that as an opportunity for them to improve their thinking or their performance in some way. We see inspiration as being really positive, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I mean, I think in my own life, a lot of times people have encouraged my creativity even when I didn't produce the right thing because they saw that I was using creative structures. I was going in a creative, I was going into a creative space. I was doing something that was maybe different from what was already on the table. And so even if it wasn't exactly the right thing, maybe, um, maybe I was being encouraged because I was doing a Thing that was perceived as being novel. And I think in many cases, um, especially when we talk about something like business innovation or educational um, processes, we often, I think, value novelty so that we can test it. 
so that maybe we can get to something no one's gotten to before that'll be even better than where we've been. And so I think there's a little bit of hope that goes on when you see people being creative that comes out and we really want to encourage that hopefulness, even if it's not technically, you know, the best product. That's okay. You mentioned, you, you, you did this now, you mentioned your creative space. Where do you go for your creative space? Tell me more about that. Well, I do a number of creative things. One of the important ones in my life is uh, I, I uh, practice a Japanese martial art uh, that's been around for uh, over 200 years. Um, it's, a, it's called a Hontai Ocean Ryu, which I don't expect anybody to remember, but it's a traditional Japanese martial arts system and it has weapons and it has jujitsu. And you learn the basics of the system, and then it allows you to be incredibly creative in your physical expressions of those, uh, of those um, activities. I find it to be really refreshing. You know, small changes in the ways that you move can lead to big outcomes. And so that's one of the creative spaces that I go to a lot. Um, I also, in, in a more mental space, I... I enjoy humor and I explore humor quite a bit um, in terms of uh, sharing humor with my friends, coming up with humorous wordplay. Um, maybe sometimes I'll make little songs. I'm always trying to be a sort of spontaneously creative with music in ways that will entertain and maybe can, um, can provide insight. I don't do a good job of bringing this into my classwork, but it's something that I find to be personally, a really, uh, a really delightful outlet throughout my day. You mentioned business, and if I'm correct, you've written a, a book, a textbook for business? Business ethics, I have. Uh, yeah, yeah, business ethics. And how did, uh, well, I, I suppose if it's et business, business ethics, that uh, critical thinking played an important role in the development of your content. It did. It did. It brought me the opportunity to apply a lot of critical thinking processes from the Foundation for Critical Thinking into um, some, some business activities where they normally don't get applied. Um, I do a lot of business consulting with groups that want to uh, that may, want to maybe look at their innovative processes. They want to look at their leadership team. Um, they maybe want to look at decisions around growth or something like that. But um, very rarely does anybody want to talk very much about ethics or ethical development or the development of the corporate culture. And so what I was trying to do with my textbook was to show how some of these critical thinking processes can help us think differently about our corporate culture, particularly um, to identify the places where corporate cultures can perhaps lead to harms to some kinds of stakeholder groups, or maybe uh, when they can hold us back, uh, some of our maybe business activities might hold us back from really being able to identify our own values and being the best kind of ethical thinker that we can be. I mean, it's, a, it's an open question how much of this is actually a day-to-day -day problem for folks, but I will say that when I bring up business ethics very often in my consulting, people don't find it to be very comfortable. They're not, they're not often ready to um, explore this as much as they are some other applications of something like critical thinking. I think it's that their uh, discomfort comes from the, uh, that it's a new process for them, or is it because they fear the leadership or the authority that uh, they're working with? Those yeah, personalities. I think, I think it's both. I think it's both. Um, when when people are able to talk about it, you know, sometimes sometimes the leaders aren't in the room who would really need to make the kinds of decisions that we might be contemplating at this point if we're gonna talk about corporate ethics. Um, sometimes there are obvious conflicts between what we might talk about in the Foundation for Critical Thinking um, between something like fair-mindedness, right? The idea that I might be willing to take all viewpoints as having equal intellectual value until I hear them and actually evaluate them, right? It's too easy just to ignore points of view out of hand, right? That's Jones in accounting, and we don't want to hear from Jones today, right? Um, so when I'm being fair-minded, often it goes against established protocols. It goes against sometimes our corporate culture, and it might under undermine some of our motives, particularly if what we want to do 
is get the upper hand on our competition or maybe work some people out of our organization who we don't feel are a good fit. And so when we start talking about these things, some people are very concerned that we might easily slip over into something like a legal area, right? And they don't want to be involved for us somehow saying something that's going to be actionable later on. And that's, you know, it's, it's delicate, of course, because of the important crossover between um, thinking about something like ethics and business and just thinking about our best thinking generally. So it seems that you're talking about those concepts that are um, really present some barriers. Would that be right? That they present some barriers to creative thought? There are some. There are some. Uh, we talk in particular about two barriers, uh, egocentric thinking and sociocentric thinking. Egocentric thinking, broadly speaking for us at the foundation, is the, uh, the set of barriers that I give myself from sort of observing the world around me and seeing what seems to work. And in an uninformed or maybe partially informed way, I start adopting practices um, that seem like they'll work out, but nobody really told me to, as opposed to the sociocentric ones, which are the, um, the suggestions, the explicit suggestions in many cases I get from culture, from my church, from my coworkers, from my family about how I should live my life and what the values are I should be undertaking. When you start to challenge those things, I mean, people get so uncomfortable, particularly when you're at work, because no one wants to do something like expose themselves in some way that, that might cause them to lose their job. I mean, there's a really big problem within critical thinking, which is how much of my best thinking should I share? Because in some cases, if I share a lot of my best thinking, particularly if it's about something like um, the way we should be conducting ourselves in the marketplace or in our corporate culture, maybe that has negative implications for me somewhere down the line in terms of my bread, right? And nobody wants to put that in jeopardy. And so I think that there, there is a lot of discomfort because people, people know they're willing to accept almost every time that these hidden biases are there. But I got to be a vice president with these hidden biases, so why uncover them now? <laughs> Understandably. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, we've talked about this before on the show, that the, the conflict that's caused by having someone in a position of authority who is not an authority, and right. those working with or on that team recognize that, but yet there's still that fear to go against that person's idea or thought. Sure, sure. Also, of course, sometimes the, the strategies that are put forth to us um, at work are not strategies that I would employ outside of work. So maybe sometimes there's a dissonance there because maybe the leadership that I'm giving, even or the leadership that I'm getting, even if it is legitimate, even if I do see it as, uh, as maybe important, um, maybe I don't feel like it's serving a set of values that I would want to emulate when I'm not doing the work. And so depending on my industry, of course, depending on the kinds of uh, things that I have to do for work, maybe that's you know, more important to some folks than, than others. But definitely my leadership team, one would hope, would be invested in the kinds of intellectual characteristics that would promote the best thinking across the board. I mean, wouldn't we hope that the best thinking at work is also just the best thinking, that the people who are, in fact, these superstars making uh, you know, gazillions of dollars out there, wouldn't it be great if we thought they were, in fact, the best thinkers across the board, such that we could trust them for all kinds of decision making? Um, unfortunately, it seems like there's there's a lot of there, there's a lot of situations where leaders in one area just don't seem to be able to think strongly in other areas. Um, maybe, for example, if I'm really great at making money versus being really great at solving you know problems of homelessness and poverty, right? It's just the knowledge transfer doesn't always work. And so, depending on the kinds of values that I really want to promote in my life some of the thinking at work just might not be really appropriate for getting me there. And that's scary, I think, for a lot of people. It is scary. Yeah. It is yeah. scary. Yeah. And, uh, and it, also, it also promotes creativity, by the way, though, right? Because a lot of people, especially when I talk to them, they, they report something like, 
I can't use this stuff at work, but I'm thinking a lot about it outside of work, right? And then unfortunately, I don't often get to follow up with them enough to, to figure out if that eventually bled back into work. But it is interesting sometimes how much people are willing to take this stuff to a place they see that's obviously a place for them to improve their thinking at home or on the neighborhood council or you know uh, at the PTA or with the lawn, whatever they're doing there or something. Um, but but just but but work is scarier. So, so as I, I listened to some of your responses through this this session, um, the idea of martial arts, if I understand correctly, that's your one of your go to places. So in the remarks that you just shared in, in these last minute or so uh, for do you think it's it, it probably is helpful for us all to have a place to go and it may, it may not be the Japanese swords that you mentioned. I, I don't think that would be my preference, but but somewhere and also probably for me to interact with other human beings outside of the workplace. Sure. What do you think? Well, I think we definitely need creative outlets. I think whatever that is, and I think that any of us can bring to our own um, mentation a, a creativity that can then be transferred into, uh, into activities such that we could enjoy it. So maybe I think, oh, you know, I really wouldn't enjoy bowling, but maybe under the right conditions and with the right people, maybe I would enjoy bowling. Um, maybe you think, oh, you know, I don't want to learn something that's going to be, you know, so significantly kind of stiff and um, uh, maybe one way like a martial arts system or something like that. I want, I want something that's going to give me more flexibility. But when we learn different creative activities, whether it's, um, whether it's knitting or whether it's using Japanese swords or whether it's throwing a Frisbee, it gives us a foundation that we can use to be creative physically. And what happens is so often we ignore the mental part of that. We don't even notice that there's a mental part in there. We just see that, oh, look, I did a different thing when I knitted this time and I got a different outcome. Not really, not really approaching it like, oh, I, I thought differently about knitting this time. And I think that that just gets, I think there's a really great multiplier effect when you start to share this with other knitters, right? So when you get out there with other people who are doing the same activities and then somebody goes, wow, I've never thought about doing it like that. Or gosh, I haven't seen anybody do that since my grandma did it or whatever. And the same thing, of course, can happen in the workplace. But when we have, I think, dedicated activities like knitting, like sword work, like basketball, I don't know what people have, baking perhaps. I think when we have these kinds of dedicated activities, it gives us a space where we're authorized to be creative and where then we can allow the creativity to really blossom in directions that, you know, if we were doing it at work and if we were maybe just doing it by ourselves without seeing the interactions of others and everything, maybe we wouldn't have quite so much foment, right? But it's really great when we can when we can feel empowered and autonomous and also supported by even the smallest of communities in order to pursue that new thing. And if it ends up being a, a mess, well, if nothing else, I have a great story about that one time I tried to get outside the box, you know? I do oh. think it really matters for that. And it probably matters to know what the box is. Too. Of course. Yeah, we need that foundation. You're right, you're right. <laughs> which which leads me to a, another question I have for you. It's it's it seems to many of us that when when we talk about creativity or a creative problem solving model, that clearly there's some kind of problem involved. Mm -hmm. And especially in business situations and team building building situations, the forced need to get the team together to work on this problem. But more often than not, the direction, if, if the solution is not practical or one that can be implemented, that perhaps the wrong problem has been identified. So how does the, your work at the foundation, because I, I, I know also that at the foundation, you're, you're going to uh, bring up those strategies to solve problems. So what, what can you share about that? Problem? Well, I mean, we have, we certainly privilege bringing in multiple points of view. We privilege the idea that 
uh, my first pass at a problem is probably not going to capture the complexity and all the dynamic elements of that problem, particularly if it's something at work. So I want to have, I want to be comfortable with a culture of questioning such that whatever features of the problem are being identified, there's a constant loop back to where we can go back and check them again in terms of new information, whether it be new conceptual information, new process information, new data, whatever it might be. We want to have uh, sort of some mechanism where I'm comfortable going back and looking at these things again. And, you know, if I'm sure about my purpose, and it's a straight line to get there. That's one thing. We probably don't need much critical thinking process if that's what we're doing. But if there's a lot of disagreement about the direction we should go to, then we probably could do a little work with questions, purposes, and points of view. Maybe we need to look at the implications and consequences of the activity that we're doing. Maybe actually everybody's closer than we think, and we, need, we just need to make some things a little more precise or we just need to ask a few more questions, or maybe we just need to get to dig into some of the people's assumptions about what any of this means. I mean, there are all kinds of different interventions that we might make. All of those that I just mentioned right now, save one, were analytic, what we would call um, mental analysis, where I can break the problem into pieces. And then also, again, I can use a certain set of high quality intellectual standards to make sure that uh, whatever I'm doing fits precisely with those purposes, points of view, consequences that I've identified for this project. Having a process to go back to, it takes longer. And that's one reason some people shy away from it, but I think it's indispensable if you can't just solve the problem, which is why we would be looking at this at all. So in the few minutes that we have that remain, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if you can share with us, uh, get a little bit more personal because you, you really are an, a good example of someone that is living a creative life, at least as, as I view in, in this, few chats I've had with you and, and what I read about you. And there's one that surprised me, but I also uh, thought it was, was a great idea. You're a comic book. What can you tell me about your comic books? Or tell well, our viewers? Sure. About 10 years ago, I wrote a grant to create a critical thinking comic book series. They're called Adventures in Critical Thinking. There are six of them that were published by the Delphi Center at the University of Louisville. And people can pick up PDFs of those if they contact the Delphi Center. They're ready to be printed in comic book format if they want. But essentially what those were is they were student written and student illustrated. So I brought together teams of different students, all of whom had had critical thinking class with me. And they had to come up with a scenario that they could use our critical thinking method at the foundation for critical thinking to think through. And so the purpose of the comic books is that in addition to being a creative outlet for the students and for me, is that uh, anybody who has one of these comic books can use the educational mechanisms in the comic books. There's some color coding, for example. There's some page referencing where you can go back and look at some theory to relate it to the examples you're looking at. Um, those mechanisms are in there so that anyone can use the comic book to teach themselves high quality critical thinking using the different stories um, in those um, in those comic books as the example. These are high quality comic books. I had the opportunity, I think, that I, since you make them available uh, okay. online, so I would encourage our, our viewers to uh, take a look at those comic books. They're they're not only fun, but they truly. I now I understand the background as you explained it a, a little bit better, and they really demonstrate the use of critical thinking, and I can see it working very nicely with students. In, thank uh, you. Decisions. They've been great to have. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Barnes, for being with us. And I really think uh, we've thoroughly enjoyed your commentary today. And uh, on behalf of myself and Dr. Barnes, we hope that our discussion enables our viewers to be more mentally creative and focused at work or anywhere else. 
Join us in viewing the creative life in two weeks. Until then, aloha.